the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Mishcon Academy session today. I'll be your host, Carrie Neal. In a world where Facebook, Meta, is bigger than any state in terms of users, are the old gods dying? And is there a new social order rising? And if so, is this liberating us or is this controlling us? We're here today with Dr. Carl Miller and we're going to be talking about all of this and more. Carl, you are the Research Director of the Centre of Analysis for Social Media at Demos. You are the author of the best-selling book, The Death of the Gods, The New Global Power Grab, great title by the way, and writer for the Sunday Times, The Guardian and The Telegraph. Welcome Carl and thank you for joining us today. Hi there Carrie, hi everyone, hello real audience, hello virtual audience, thanks for having me. How do you see disputes fought out in the information battle space generally? The way I see this essentially is it begins not with the data, not with the technology, not with Russia or China or geopolitics or any state. It just begins with a simple idea. Um, and the idea is, um, I think, a hugely important one, a very extensible, very elastic one. But it, the idea is basically a way of seeing information as being a theater of war. It's something that militaries have done and rewritten about and argued for. It's something that lots of other organizations have done as well, implicitly, explicitly in part two. But the idea is basically that you see joining air, sea, land, space, information is a kind of like a metaphorical space, I guess. It's a, and it, it's one that warfare happens within, that you maneuver within, that you have to dominate, that you have to, that you have to win within in order to win in any kind of conflict. Um, and I think that is the kind of like absolute starting point. Wherever this conversation goes, whatever you want to discuss, um, that idea, I think, is completely changing the world. Can you talk us about the methods that you use? And I mean, you'll talk through this a bit more, but the semantic, semantic profiling, yeah. and th these are all incredible areas of data. Oh, Carrie, that warms my heart. No one ever <laughs> talks about methods. I spent, so I've spent the last 10 years like building and using and working with people to, to, well, to work on social media research methods. No one's ever interested in it. So what a brilliant second welcome, question that we can welcome, dwell on. Thank you. Because I do love data too. So. Um, brilliant. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, so they, I mean, to me, this is as exciting as any other part of the story. So, so I mean, if, if we jump back kind of 10 years, I guess, just for a moment, we both saw the emergence of social media platforms, obviously, as huge agents of social change. We knew they were going to change so much, you know, about who we are and why we get up in the morning and the things that we love and the things that we value and who we know. We knew we were going to change all of those things. It was going to rummage around, you know, and change what it meant to be human, really. Um, but on the, but they were also unbelievable new sources of data and information. Like they would transform um, how human beings are studied, how society is studied. You know, and all those humanistic disciplines, everything from behavioural science all the way through to social science and and and, and so social and cognitive psychology could all suddenly tap into these. Basically, I think the datification of social life. You know, um, everything that we were doing normally suddenly got turned into digital versions of itself that we could count. Um, but it exploded all the conventional ways we have of researching society. You know, you can't do surveys and polls on millions and millions of Facebook posts or tweets. So really for the last 10 years, that's what myself and colleagues have been building is, is and lots of other people around the world as well now too, um, basically new ways of handling all of this. Uh, and it's, it's been a kind of strange, intricate kind of finessing, I think, of two different worlds. You know, one, the world I mentioned of social science and, you know, over a century's memory, basically, of us trying to work out how to study people and all the ways that we can get that wrong. Yeah. But joining that, we've had to kind of pull in a whole, like, muscular suite of, like, kind of data science analytics. You know, stuff that can basically handle data at the vast scale, complexity, you know, and contradictory and messiness, actually, that we find on social media data. And it's been a question of really trying to, like, scrounge and scrub those two things together to kind of try and create a kind of strange new hybrid discipline, which lets us both make sense of all that data at the scale which it's being created, but in ways which is kind of sensitive to social science and, and humanities. How does civic society identify false news in, in, in this space and on, on, online manipulation in parallel to the big tech companies? Well, th there's two important points to make here. Um, firstly, um, fake news um, has come to kind of dominate the kind of way in which we describe this whole problem. But actually, it's, it's only a small part of this kind of shadowy tradecraft of information manipulation. You, you see me groping for the words to describe this. You know, sometimes I talk about information operations, sometimes information warfare, sometimes, uh, sometimes disinformation. But it's strange. It's not a word which properly encapsulates it. But a lot of this has nothing to do with falsehood. 
you know, you can make a very distorted picture of the world simply by amplifying some truths over others. And when we actually look at these operations, that's often what we see. We see amplification of Daily Mail stories and just the shutting out of other stories. And that alone is enough to build a very warped picture of the world. But, but up there, there's also a lot more interaction with the way that people feel rather than how they think. So, so often we get this kind of wrongful view that the, really the problem is that there are these shadowy actors that are kind of lying to you, Carrie or me, mm. and then we form these like mis like the, these 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 ill-founded beliefs about the world, and you know, and, and, and go out and act them. on them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then share them or act on them or vote or, or whatever. Yeah. But that's not really what you, is happening. Instead, there's this kind of whole interaction around how you, you the identity that you have, the, the friends that you have, the the values which you hold, and and and, and kind of more dynamically just your your feelings of rage and outrage and sense of wrong in the world um, and sometimes kind of humor as well um, and that's really what these operations exploit they, they're really not lying to people they're they're actually confirming people's beliefs about the world and then guiding that very very powerfully in certain directions under the online safety laws the government claims that the internet is going to be a safer place for everyone everyone involved which obviously is quite a positive view of, of, of an outlook of it and those platforms which fail to protect those people um, will need to answer to the regulator it's quite again quite a big job for the Ofcom there and is this a realistic policy aim firstly but what are the implications of freedom of expression and the concept of immunity will there ever be immunity again and how what do you think? Before the online safety bill, there was basically no democratic control in any way over what the responsibilities companies would be to protect you and me online, all the way through to straight up, you know, badge carrying terrorists using their site. And I was in debates 10 years ago where the tech giants would be sending their public affairs spokespeople who were arguing it wasn't their problem that terrorists were using their platforms. Wow. So, you know, we, we never thought that we, we could get there simply by this kind of strange kind of public embarrassment of the tech giants. You know, they would only act in the, in the, in the high profile issues. They'd act in markets which they, you know, thought they were more exposed to. They would act in kind of this very reactive way, which is basically around, you know, reputation management. Um, so we always thought you needed something way more systematic and was basically properly constituted under democratic control. That's what you needed to really begin to actually change the online world in the ways that you wanted to. So much is in the online safety bill, and and it's, it's been very difficult. I mean, like disinformation, as my understanding is, um, won't be dealt with in primary statutory legislation at all. So that's going to be a kind of follow-up legislation that's going to come in to try and handle disinformation down the line. But it won't be handled in what will finally be passed. Um, and of course, yeah, you know, the, the actual definition of online harm has been a raging debate across all the communities involved in this for for, for years and years now. Um, and and there are loads of risks around it as well. I mean, I remember the, the Royal Society recently came forward saying, you know, how important it is for scientific development for there to be kind of heretical, you know, kind of like opinions kind of introduced those debates as well. I mean, those on the other side, we perhaps say that doesn't have anything to do with lots of Nazis on YouTube. But like, it, it's, it, it's, it's never going to please everyone, this bill. But, but I, I would much, much rather be in a world where that bill is in law and we're having debates about how to finesse and change and evolve it than the one that we've been in before where we've been reliant on a series of huge and very distant companies with very perverse and mixed incentives um, to basically shape the worlds where we're increasingly living in. After the kind of capital riots in the US and a kind of Facebook and Twitter and others responded heavily to, the, to that and, and, and yeah. began to clear off QAnon and kind of the alt-right Significant, of course, Trump was banned. Yeah. Um, we, we, we did see then a kind of, a, which is continuing, a kind of fracturing of um, kind of extremist political mobilizations onto a whole array of new platforms. You know, um, some of them are kind of like a gamer platforms and streamer platforms. Some of those are um, platforms deliberately set up to be a new home for free speech for the, for the far right. Um, so that for sure is already happening. Mm. Um, but then uh, kind of alongside that, we're seeing, and I think this is scarier, the kind of rise of decent, kind of truly decentralized platforms. You know, these are ones where, where there is no company at the heart. I mean, you don't need Facebook, the company, to create Facebook, the network. You really don't. Um, and for instance, there's a protocol version of, of, of uh, Twitter called Macedon, where everyone can basically set up and run their own like mini servers. And I think if you're Ofcom, if you're governments, if you're lawyers, like, what that really means, and maybe I'll put this to everyone to see what they think, is a creeping of the whole of the online world further and further away from the reach of the law in general, is what I think is happening. You can create a company baked into the blockchain now and smart contracts that has no articles association, no real conventional legal footprint at all. You know, and that could be a company where you invest in stuff. It could be a company where you engage politically. I think 
the next presidential election is going to see a whole array of these, like funding and, and kind of engaging in political advertising. Um, there's, you know, the free Julian Assange DAO, so there's going to be quite a lot of these for activism. And the, the rub is that none of these are companies. Mm. Like they're, they're not registered in companies' house. They've got no, they've got no um, legal impersonation, as far as I understand it, at all. So who do you find? You know, who do you, um, who do you pick up the phone to to complain or send a legal letter to? Yeah, and that, that is honestly that. my big worry, is that um, you know, the law, and I speak as a non-lawyer, is unbelievably important to kind of like be this thing that we use to control and shape society to try and manage behaviours which we think are wrong. You know, be that civil or criminal law, tort or anything. You know, essentially, it's supposed to be restitu restitutive, really, and, and to kind of um, levy costs and risks against behaviours which we think are harmful to society and to the individuals within it. Within it. But one of the big trends, mega trends, that you see across really the whole landscape of technology, I think, is this move, this drift of both the platforms themselves and the people that are using them away from the reach of the law. You know, and the law is becoming kind of quieter and in some cases like kind of actually quite irrelevant. How can we bring this to light where people in society can see it? Partly, I think this is bringing a whole array of new people, including lawyers, into actually kind of building the tools and building the new processes, the new understandings to kind of almost like reweave the law to kind of, you know, to kind of haul everything back in. Like, and actually, information warfare is a great example here. So information warfare has kind of grown up. Like many online practices, it's emerged faster than the law really has been able to keep up. So a lot of this isn't illegal. A lot of this isn't, I, I don't think, is, is necessarily open to uh, criminal prosecution or hasn't been used, and there's no very little case law for that. Um, and that means that kind of, in terms of our responses to it, they're, they're very weak. I mean, at the moment, our ways of responding to information warfare, even when kind of geeks like me and my colleagues kind of like build the models and pull it, pull it apart, you know, and show, show it to likely be present, is, is basically you either go to the platforms and you ask them to take it down, or you try and teach people through journalism or through like public digital literacy campaigns how to become a bit more resilient to it. But and how, how do you become more resilient to it? Like, how do you spot it? What, what do we do? Well, so my point is, Carrie, really, that we can't expect people to, because this is a tradecraft that's being like, developed by intelligence agencies. Like, we, we, we can't expect to kind of upscale a population in general to stay on top of a constantly changing tradecraft of online manipulation. OK, I'm just going to have a quick look at the questions, because um, they are flying in. If fake news is trying to confirm people's existing beliefs rather than try to change them, what tools oh, does, a, <laughs> does a state have, a co have to combat, defend and prevent it? So, I, I mean, as a, as a writer, and I'm sure actually as many, many, many people watching this as well that, that, that hopefully agree with me, I, I find the, the, the basic idea of information warfare distressing um, for one main reason, which is that it kind of drains any kind of inherent value out of information itself. Because in the world of information warfare, writing and culture and, 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 and the idea of truth and the examination of the human condition, these simply all turn into like instruments with the ulterior motives of behavior and attitudinal change. Like, and you kind of don't care what the information is. It's a vehicle to, get, to achieve those things, which is distressing because like, I think plenty of us would say that information and all the things which it contains have a value unto itself. Um, so um, the, what you really hope um, is that somehow we can try and declare a peace in the information rather than militarizing it. I think the kind of like, the, the, the instinct knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, um, what we need is liberal democratic states as our own, you know, more effective form of information warfare. Yeah. You know, and we need our own rules of engagement. We need our own capabilities. And we need to be able to like, manoeuvre better in there. But, but, but I, I, I do not think in the long run we are served better by you know, increasing the militarisation of it. Um, and that means that the kind of response kind of has to be asymmetric. So rather than like fighting information warfare with other inf with more information warfare, we actually actually turn to this whole array, which I think we need to build, and I think the law is a really important part of that. This whole array of other approaches. I think we need to open up like consumer rights legislation for this, defamation law, libel law, criminal legislation. We might need like a new like digital sedition act to like actually criminalise some of the very worst forms of this. Um, 
regulation, of course, as well. Informational activism, you know, people getting in, like in, actually in the face of some of the perpetrators doing this. Um, and yeah. this sounds strange for a liberal think tanker to say, but, but honestly, I think actually state power in some cases too, like cyber offensive operations. I would actually like to see our state go more, more, with more appetite going after some of the kind of underlying infrastructure which allows this kind of stuff to happen. Thank you um, so much for your time today, Carl. That's been absolutely fantastic. You have been an incredible guest at the Academy <laughs> today. I much, much appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Carrie. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com. <laughs>